Hello again, faithful philosophical listeners. And I hope you are faithful. Let's put that to the test. Have a look at these statements and simply answer true or false to what you believe about each one. God and the universe are one and the same. That's also known as pantheism. Life after death, that's an old chestnut. The universe is eternal. A lot of people happily would go along with that until it's pointed out that maybe it had a beginning. I mean, the Big Bang suggests that and a lot of religions suggest that. So if you say the universe is eternal, then you're denying both of those explanations. Only the material world exists. And have a look at the others for yourself. Take your time. It's quite important because if you get one wrong, you could be legally sentenced to death. So think it over. I, as I'm sure like you, am a sucker for medieval religious philosophy and these statements are from the 1277 list produced by the University of Paris of things that you can't think. Today a lot of these seem innocuous. God and the universe are one and the same. Does that make a lot of difference? God can't have made more than three dimensions. It's peculiar, isn't it? Because we now recognise that there are more than three dimensions. So my heretical proclamation in the 13th century is today science, maths and geometry. God can't move the universe in a straight line. Why not? Well, otherwise he'd create a vacuum. I thought that was obvious. Nor can he make several universes. So so that's uh, all the string theorists in fear of their lives. Right, up to here, you might have thought, you know, I don't really believe in God. So here's a couple for you. Theology is based on a collection of fables and you can't learn anything from studying theology. I wonder if there's one person alive today that doesn't believe at least one of these things. Hieresis is the original Greek word meaning a taking or choosing, which began to mean a philosophical sect or a school, thereby giving us a nice concrete thing to hang heresy on. This philosophical sect is heretical, it has chosen badly. Thank heavens that we went through the Reformation, the Enlightenment, the rights revolutions, the civil rights movements, etc. To finally arrive at a place when you can think freely, you can think what you jolly well... Eh, what? What's this you're telling me? In the United Kingdom, certain ways of thinking are illegal. That can't be true. Isn't that the essence of heresy? While I was investigating this concept, I came across several takes on what is heretical. A lot of the suggested heresies are jocular in tone, as evidenced by a BBC radio programme of the same name, where people offer unpopular opinions. It's okay to put pineapple on pizza seems to be about the level. So we're looking for something a little bit more profound. Here's one from a list I found on Less Wrong. We should systematically expose children to death by teaching Death 101 in schools. This would have a positive effect on society, etc. Eco-terrorism, animal rights terrorism is morally justified and should be practiced by those who advocate the causes, etc. I don't find anything heretical about these. In fact, I agree with the first one. (laughs) So there you go. I'm a heretic. I don't want to frighten our children, but I don't agree with telling them that everything is great, everything is going to work out fine, and you're a superhero. I just, I really don't think it's psychologically good for them. But there you go. I'm debating it with my putative online opponent. None of these would actually raise any hackles, and I suggest because they've already been well rehearsed over history, or they don't seem to have big repercussions. I'm going to propose that heresy exists still in the modern day. It's not the Catholic Church, of course, that we are sinning against. It is some kind of zeitgeist. As Bernard Shaw once said, the morals of a nation are like its teeth. The more rotten they are, the more it hurts to touch them. So let's go and have a look and see what are the morals of modern day UK. Is it true, or is it a fanatical exaggeration to say that thought crime as envisaged by George Orwell and Minority Report, has come into existence. Of course, a first question here would be, suppose you are thinking badly, what's the solution? Do you get put in a gulag until you think correctly? Do you get subjected to an Alex-style reassignment programme, as in A Clockwork Orange? 
I find the idea quite terrifying. Some don't. I guess they have no Jungian shadow. But see if you agree with me that there are certain areas of public life where you could consider opinions heretical. Let's have a look at two. The first one is a chap who lives in London and he didn't like seeing lots of Palestinian flags in his street. And he let everyone know about it. In a kind of they come over here speech, he made a public complaint on his TikTok or whatever platform it was. I did try to find it, unfortunately I couldn't. I think I've described it accurately. He has a little bit of a swear about the fact that there's lots of Palestinian flags in Bethnal Green, where he lives, in London. This is what happened next. The reasons why we did oh, this is on the 17th and 10th of 2023, on Bethnal Green Road at 10 and 4, you, you were witnesses saying, obviously, people, why, why are they over here, etc., we let them into our country, etc. So, sure. Yes, okay. So, you? And the interesting part here, for me, is where the rather upset woman challenges the police by saying, yeah, so fucking what? Am I not allowed to have that opinion? If you dug down, couldn't you make an argument? Couldn't you say, I don't think it's right that our capital city has been overtaken by proponents of a side in a foreign war? Of course, the thinking behind this non-crime hate incident idea is that it's a kind of fence-sitting, but not really. Like, you haven't committed a crime, don't worry about that, but you will have a little asterisk against your name for the rest of your life that says you indulge in a hate incident. Now, hate, not nice, is it? But sometimes you do hate things. If I stood up and said, I hate injustice, I hate war, people might not have a problem. And the thinking behind this law is to try to contain things so that people don't get offended and take action. On the free speech issue, people who might even call themselves free speech absolutists draw the line at certain cases. You won't find many people defending the right to shout fire in a crowded theatre when there isn't one. You won't find many people defending the right for children to, to be able to read absolutely anything and have access to everything on the internet. And you won't find most free speech advocates defending the right to violence so that when incitement to violence is contained within the speech, then it crosses the line. That's what the British law says. And I happen to agree with it on this point. But can we pinpoint where our London resident went wrong? Who is his hate speech directed at? Is it Palestinians? Is it Palestinians living in London? Is it the white liberals who put the flags up? Is it the fact that the area he lives is now majority foreign born? There are lots of questions. The bedrock though seems to be that by law you are not allowed to hate an object of hatred, be it the government, the police, minorities. And my first two examples there, by the way, I think that that's where I start to wonder. If you introduce these laws to protect people that need protecting, I can't help but think that governments will pull a little lever to make sure that criticism of themselves is no longer possible. We've even seen the first inroads into that under the not long to go now Conservative government of the United Kingdom. Now, the free speech thing comes in, of course, because this is where you find out if it's heretical or not. If you're not allowed to say something, then presumably you either think it to yourself and keep shtum, or you just try not to think about it. Or maybe you get educated. That's another favourite of our modern world, isn't it? I'm going to educate you on this. Well, that might work. But as we've seen recently, a lot of these education programmes don't even allow you to put forward a contrary point of view. As the man who used the N-word while asking a question about when you can or cannot use the N-word got himself into a lot of trouble. Thankfully he was vindicated because when we go down this route we're going into Alice in Wonderland absurdism. But I'll just leave you with one more heresy to ponder. A little rhyme to set you in the mood. A gay man from Khartoum brought a lesbian up to his room, but they argued all night over who had the right to do what and with which and to whom. 
If you found that amusing, of course, you might be in trouble. I leave you with the following case, which involved a humorous limerick. This is Harry Miller, who received a visit from the police in order to, quote, check his thinking, end quote. See which way you go on this issue. But remember, the point of this video is not to take sides. It's to put forward the idea that there are certain opinions that, if we were in Paris in the year 1277, would definitely get put on that list. Harry Miller, a former police officer, is celebrating what he's called a massive victory for free speech. People are offended. Whether it's Brexit, Tories, elections, simple offence cannot be a measure um, for um, triggering police involvement. The judge has said that, one, none of my tweets were even in the foothills of harassment, and two, that homicide police acted like the Stasi, the Gestapo, and the Checker. Now, that is quite a statement. Quite a statement. He's basically saying, look, if people are nasty to you on Twitter, just go away. And if you expand that into other areas, if people are nasty to you, just go away, then that actually sort of gives a green light to bullying.